club. We can't find a church. Well, who told you to leave? Thank God for the word this morning and jump right in. What a beautiful time of worship, amen? amen? And I pray that you entered in and that the Lord prepared your heart. The worship and the word work together. Worship prepares our heart for the Holy Spirit to drive the truth of the word into us. And uh, God always does his best work during worship. When he created the heavens and the earth, the angels were worshiping, amen? They had all those angels with electric guitars, Tony, I know. So, Father, this morning we thank you for worshiping the word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have prepared us to receive your word and the riches of your word and the treasures of your word. So uh, let there be good ground in our hearts today. And, Father, let the truth and the principles go into us deep, and Lord, and let them go into the reservoir of our spirits that they would be at our disposal whenever we need them. Pour the word into us today and change us by it from the inside out. We prayed in Jesus' name, and the church said... Amen. Well, here we are in uh, repentance and talking about the churches, and we asked the question, what do Christians need to repent of way back in part one of the series? And the, the reason that repentance is not just for the lost and it's for the, the person who knows Jesus, too, is because we all still sin. Yeah. And I ask this question every week, and I'm hoping for a better response, but anyone have a sinless week? <laughs> nah, we blew it again. And the truth is all of us sin and we need to go to the Lord in repentance and to repent of those sin. If we confess our sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, amen. But if we pretend we don't have sin, we make him out to be a liar. This is what the word teaches us. We say, well, I'm a Christian, I don't sin. Well, of course we do. It's just that we have access to the blood of Jesus that wipes away all our sin and brings forgiveness and restoration to our lives. But we have to avail ourselves of that opportunity and the mechanism to avail ourselves of it is repentance. So what do Christians need to repent for? We said in answering that question, we were going to look at the churches that Jesus spoke to in the book of Revelation. He spoke to seven churches there, and he told uh, five out of the seven to repent. Now, we've covered three of the five so far. We're going to keep covering them until we're done, but uh, understand, repentance is part of the Christian experience. It doesn't just get you into the kingdom. It keeps you useful to the king. Amen. Sin that we refuse to repent of will be a stumbling block and a wall between us and God. So we looked at the church of Ephesus, and that was the apostles' church, and, and they needed to repent of leaving their first love. How many would acknowledge that, you know, staying in love with Jesus should be the number one priority of our lives? And I've asked this question, how's your love life today? Are you in love with Jesus? Are you passionate for him? Are you excited about him? You know, any relationship that's loveless is a drain. If you're in a loveless relationship and there's no excitement, there's no passion, you come home and the dog don't even greet you, come on. You know, that's not the way God intended it to be. So we have to maintain our, our connection and our affection to Jesus Christ by maintaining our first love. Then he spoke to Pergamos, and that was the church that uh, tolerated the compromise of false doctrine. Their issue was that they compromised with the world, amen? So if there's any compromise in us, and it easily gets in there, and we shouldn't think that we're immune to it. Why? This world is sneaky, and it's pushy, and it's deceptive. And before you know it, you and I can exchange the truth of God for a lie. We see compromise everywhere in our world, and even in the body of Christ, it's a huge issue. So we've got to maintain our first love. We've got to drive compromise out of our life. Then we looked at Thyatira, and it talked about that Jezebel spirit that brings corruption to the church. It exchanges the morality of God for immorality, the prophets of God for the prophets of Baal. It, it allows sexual immorality to come into the church, and they tolerated Jezebel. They allowed her to exist within the church, and Jesus told them to repent of it. So we continue here. Next up is the church of Sardis in Revelation 3, 1 through 6. Let me read you what Jesus says to Sardis. Now listen, every part of this is important. So listen to every part of it. To the angel of the church of Sardis write, do you hear what he said? To the angel, remember that. To the angel of the church of Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds 
that you have a name, that you are alive, and yet you are dead. Jesus speaks to a church here that he calls dead. Verse 2. Be constantly alert and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds or your works completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Then if you are not alert, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people, say few, You have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. Interesting imagery there. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who overcomes will be clothed the same way, in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There's a lot to unpack there, and we're going to take it bite by bite here. Jesus speaks to the church here. Now, if Ephesus was the loveless church, and then Pergamos was the compromised church, and Thyatira was the corrupt church, Sardis is the dead church. I don't know about you, but I don't want anything in my life described as dead. Amen? It's not a flattering thing. How's your intellect? It's dead. How's your memory? It's dead. How's your love life? It's dead. Got really quiet at that one. (laughs) Now I'm talking about with Jesus, my wife smiling at me on the front row. But nothing in our life that's described as dead is a good thing. Yet Jesus looks at this whole entire church and he describes it as dead. There's an interesting and unique way that Jesus is described as he speaks to Sardis. If you'll notice, every time he speaks to a church, there's a description of Jesus. In this description here, very interesting, he says, he who has, talking about Jesus, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. Let's look at the description there because there's some implications that speak to the situation that's going on in Sardis by the description of who Jesus has depicted picked it out now he's the one who has so these things are within his possession he has number one the seven spirits of god now that might be an interesting term it's used in a few places in scripture and it might be a little bit confusing but as we look under the hood uh, most scholars agree with little dissension that this is absolutely a description of the holy spirit The Holy Spirit is descripted as what? The one who has seven spirits. Why? Because apparently there are seven functions and operations associated with the Holy Spirit and how he moves, and he is depicted as the one who has seven spirits. Sometimes the Holy Spirit comes to convict. Sometimes the Holy Spirit comes to comfort. Sometimes the Holy Spirit comes to bring illumination to the Word. Come on. There are different operations of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit comes in the prophetic. Sometimes it comes in the form of healing. What are the seven operations? Well, there's no definitive list, but we can speculate, and I'm throwing some things out there uh, according to how we perceive the Spirit moving, but the seven spirits of God uh, depict the Holy Spirit of God. Now, understand something today. Seven is God's number of complete perfection. When the Holy Spirit does something, it's perfect. When the Holy Spirit moves and it is the Holy Spirit and it's not a human spirit or demonic spirit, it's perfect. When the Holy Spirit moves, come on, church, today, you and I should desire the move of the Holy Spirit. (coughs) Uh, And what's being depicted here is that Jesus uh, has in his hands, he holds Uh, He's in control of the Holy Spirit. Revelation 1-4 makes a reference to the seven spirits of God. Listen again. We get a little more light here. It says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. There again, speaking to seven churches. He says, uh, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's Jesus. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne. So in Jesus' name and in the name of the Holy Spirit there, we see this 
pronunciation, the seven spirits who are before the throne. So we know that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. The scripture tells us that. We get a good indication here of the Trinity and the, the move of the Holy Spirit and a reference to the seven spirits. So we know that that's the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is under the direction of Jesus Christ. Number two, let's look at the seven stars. Now, the only thing I knew about seven stars was that it was a diner at one time. And it was expensive. I never paid so much for eggs, Lewis. But this is not, uh, you know, a description of a diner. Uh, this is not a description of men or popular people or famous preachers. No, these seven stars are a reference to the angels assigned over the churches by Jesus himself. If you'll notice, and I called it to your attention as we read the text, uh, every time Jesus speaks to one of his churches, he speaks about a particular angel and addresses his correspondence to that church through the angel of the church. Look what it says here in chapter 3, to the angel of the church in Sardis. So this is how Jesus speaks to the churches. He doesn't speak to a board. He doesn't speak to a committee. He doesn't speak to one pastor, the biggest church in the area. Hello. He speaks to the angel over the church. Why? Because there are angelic powers in, uh, over the church that uh, push back against the dominions and the demonic things and protect the church, and they are assigned over the church by Jesus Christ. Now, we can't see it in the natural realm this morning, but there are the angels of God in our midst here in the sanctuary as we worship, as the word is preached. There are angels assigned to protect the churches. Now, one time we had an evangelist coming, and he, uh, he came in, and I had never met him before. He walked in, and he said, um, is your office in that back corner of the building? And I said, yeah, why? He goes, when I came in the parking lot, I saw three big angels over that corner of the building. I said, thank you, Jesus. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> so uh, the angelic realm is something that, you know, we're, we should be privy to, we should understand. But the seven stars, the seven angels over the church, Jesus addresses them. Now understand, he says to the angel of the church of Sardis, right. Now these two references here in the description of Jesus give us a picture of who Jesus is and what Sardis needs to know about Jesus. He's the one who has. That's a reminder that you know who controls the move of the Holy Spirit in the church? It's Jesus. You know who controls the ministering angels and the spirits that protect us and keep us from demonic attack and from being deceived? It's Jesus. He controls these things, amen? The church needs to know it's Jesus. It's not a board. It's not a denomination. It's not a doctrine. It's not a famous preacher. No, it's Jesus who controls controls all of these things. We need the move of the Holy Spirit in the church. We need the Holy Ghost to move in this place. We don't need more wisdom and intellect and, you know, nice little sermons with a couple jokes and good air condition and more padding on our seats. What we need is the Holy Ghost to move at Full Gospel Center. Amen. And Jesus controls that. And Jesus was telling Sardis, look, if you want to be alive and not dead, if you want the Spirit of God to move, if you want to be resurrected spiritually, if you want to stop being lukewarm and become hot again, you need to come through me because I control all the things in the church that would breathe life back into it. Interesting description of who Jesus is. Verse 1, Jesus follows form as when he speaks to all the churches. He says to Sardis, I know your deeds. I know your works. And he says that to all the churches. And if you'll notice, when he says that to the churches, most of the churches he's saying that to, he will list off their works. You know, you got love and you got good deeds and you, you got patience and you've not denied my name. All kinds of good things. If you'll notice here, he says, I know your deeds. And then he lists none. Goose egg, nothing, nada, no deeds. He says, that you, this is the only thing that, that I got to say to you. You have a name that you are alive. You have a reputation of being spiritual, and yet you are dead. Wow. I don't know about you, but if you're Sardis, and it's time, you know, I know your works, and then there's like just static, that's a real indictment against what's going on at Sardis. He says, you know what, I've got no works to list, and the fact is that you are actually dead. Uh, 
this is a sobering thought that Jesus would speak to an entire portion of people who call themselves the church and say, you know, you got no works to, to list here, and my assessment of you is that you are dead. Jesus' estimation of Sardis was they had produced no spiritual fruit and nothing worth mentioning. Now, I would suspect if Sardis was to be asked the question, how, are you, how is the church at Sardis? They would, say, they would list off their works and their accomplishments and the things they've done and how many they had attendance and how much money they took in. Why, why, would, you, why would we be safe in assuming that? Because it's human nature for us to overestimate our own accomplishments, our own virtues, and our own self-importance. That's human nature. Oh, I did this and I did that. I was sharing with first service one time, Pastor Mike. I ran into some guy who came off the mission field. And if you listen to him talk for five minutes and you would think, you know, he was somewhere in the Trinity between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You know, I did this and I did that and I raised the dead and I healed the sick. And I'm like, wow, glory to you. And I'm like, that's the wrong heart. There's no humility in it. It's glory stealing. Gee, if anyone gets healed, if anyone gets delivered, if anyone gets saved, if anyone gets set free, that's all God, amen. That, that's God doing that. Yet Sardis did not think of themselves how Jesus thought of them. They, they, they were enamored with their own accomplishments, their own virtues, their own self-importance. You and I need to kill our pride and grab a hold of some humility, amen? We need to disarm our self-importance and learn to be humble before our God. When Irving S. Olds was chairman of the U.S. Steel Corporation, he arrived at a stockholders meeting, and he was immediately confronted by a woman who bluntly asked him, who are you and what do you do here? Without batting an eye, Olds replied, I'm your chairman. Of course, you know the duties of a chairman. That's the one who's roughly the equivalent of parsley on a dinner plate. <laughs> it's good to stay little in your own eyes. God said, the prophet said to Saul, Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, did I not make you king over all Israel? The problem with Saul is he didn't stay little in his own eyes. He got what we call too big for his britches. And his pride got him in a lot of trouble. And eventually it got him rejected by God and the kingdom was ripped out of his hand. So you and I need to stay humble, not to be those who would just shamelessly spout off our accomplishments and our virtues and our, our own self-importance. We've all met people like that who, you know, they lie, they, 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 you're with them for five minutes and they just want to talk about themselves. Anyone ever meet somebody who has eye trouble? I did this and I did that and I'm an eye and I, it's eye trouble. Humility is what God wants us to have. Jesus speaks to a church that's spiritually dead, yet they thought of themselves as much more than that, yet he strips them and humbles them with his words. There is nothing to list of your spiritual fruit here. You have a reputation or you project that you're alive, but in all actuality, you are dead. Jesus saw nothing that was going on in Sardis to have any eternal value. This dovetails perfectly with the point that Jesus made in Matthew 7. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said this, and this is startling scripture here if we allow it to penetrate our hearts. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Did you see that? Verse 22, many will say to me, look at that, many will say to me on that day. So people like Sardis who thought they were spiritually vibrant, but in God's eyes were spiritually dead. The many of them will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name or in your name cast out demons or in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So there again, our opinion and our estimation of our own self and our own works and our own accomplishment and our own value is a moot point when we stand before God. We need to look in the mirror and ask God what he thinks of us. Like David said, search me and know me, test my heart, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me. In the end, it's only God's opinion that'll matter. Everybody could think you're swell and great and your mom will still tell you you're handsome and even the church might say you're wonderful. 
And I'm thankful for encouragement, and I'm thankful for people who speak encouragement into my life. But really, I take those things with a grain of salt because I want to know what God thinks of me. Because in the end, that's all that's going to matter, saints, what he thinks. And when it came to Sardis, he's like, you produce no spiritual fruit worth mentioning. You project that you're alive, that you have spiritual vitality, but you are, in fact, dead. Now, Jesus continues here in verse 1. See how much fun we had and we are only halfway through verse 1. <laughs> he continues uh, to say you have a reputation of being alive. Look, that you have a name. Look at that. You got the name. You got the title. You, you know, you got the marquee with your church name on it. You got the name that you are alive, but you are in fact dead. What, what is he saying there? What are the implications of that statement? Well, it goes like this. The name on the building says church, but there's no move of the Holy Spirit in the building. Nobody gets convicted of sin there. Nobody gets saved. No one comes to the altar to repent. No one's hungry or thirsty for the things of God. The name on the building says church, but nothing's going on inside. The name on the office says reverend, but there's no anointing. There's no personal holiness. There's no victory or overcoming life. There's no one with passion behind the pulpit. The title on the door says reverend, but there's nothing Godly producing fruit coming out of the pulpit. The name of Christ is mentioned, but he's not really invited, he's not really reverenced, and he's not even present or even missed during the performance of their rituals. People come lost hoping to find God, but instead find ritual, ceremony, tradition, rules, religion, but not God. This is a description of a dead church. And you say, Pastor, you know, why are you picking on the church? I'm not. I'm pointing out what Jesus said. Why? Because if we find ourselves in a place like this, we need to shake the dust off our shoes and get out of there and leave that place behind because we don't need religion. We need relationship. We don't need ritual. We need holiness. Come on. You and I need to go to the well where there's life. And I say this because I, I, I've said this before. I know in New York you're all trying to get out of here. And every week, somebody left. And if you leave and go someplace else, you go to a place that's a well of life, that has life in it, that teaches the Bible, that lets the Holy Spirit move. Come on. When you, if you have to find another church, people call up, we can't find a church. Well, who told you to leave? <laughs> but if you find yourself being moved, make sure you go to a place that's not dead. I've seen it so many times. People leave and move when God didn't move them, find themselves in a spiritual desert with no, uh, the word of God is stifled and they can't find their spot and they wither and suffer because of it. Jesus spoke to those who were spiritually dead in his generation. He spoke to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Look what he says here in Matthew 13, 15. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woo! Jesus from chapter 13 of how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> He says, you guys, man, you, you guys are so hypocritical and dead, you know, whitewashed tombs with dead man's bone. You make a convert, and you make them so religious and lost and so nitpicky. You make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. Wow. Jesus called out dead religion, and he, he, he gave it no quarter. He was relentless with it. He wasn't kind with it. He didn't mince his words. He called it what it was. That's really quiet this morning. They're like, did this guy take his medicine this morning? <laughs> Jude describes those who are spiritually dead in Jude one twelve. He says this, these people are a blemish at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed themselves. Look at that. People behind the pulpit who don't feed the flock, but they just enrich themselves. I'm, I'm sure we can figure out what the implication is there. They are, listen, Clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted, twice dead. That, imp that inference there where he says, clouds without rain, what does that mean? Someone who projects themselves to be spiritual, it looks like they have the ability to produce rain that would bring life, but yet when you get up close, it's just smoke and mirrors, there's nothing there. 
How many times have we gotten around people who claim to be spiritual and been close enough to realize that they're, they're not even, they're carnal? I've went out to lunch with people who pastor churches in the Hudson Valley. I remember going out to lunch with one pastor, and after sitting there for 15 minutes, I, I was totally convinced the guy wasn't saved. He was, you know, didn't have any idea how to lead the church or what his role was. He believed in all kinds of immoral doctrines that were unbiblical. And I walked out of there, and I'm like, this is what's, this is what's at the wheel of that church? God helped them. Well, you know this, and well, you know that. No, we don't condemn anybody, and we let anything happen in our church. It's a sad state of affairs. Clouds without rain. Autumn trees without fruit. You go to the tree for fruit, and there's nothing. Twice dead. Jesus spoke to the spiritual dead in his generation. And he spoke to Sardis and he declared them dead. Now, Jesus doesn't leave Sardis in the pitiful state that it's in. He gives them some kind of hope. Don't you love that about Jesus? Amen. Jesus will correct you and tell you like it is, but then he doesn't just drop the mic and go... No, he gives, him, he, he gives him some hope here. He provides Sardis a four-point remedy uh, that if they'll do it, it will revive their spiritual deadness. Now, I want you to look what he says here. Number one, in verse two, he says, be constantly alert and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds or your works complete in the sight of my God. Listen to verse three. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Then if you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come. Thank you. That's the Wednesday night crowd. They know it's awkward when I take a drink, so they clap so I don't feel so silly. Thank you, guys. So here's a four-point remedy Jesus gives. If you're dead and you need to be revived, how many know God revives dead things? He, he, he called Lazarus out of the grave, amen. He, he, the, the, you know, he rose from the grave on the third day. So God, we have a problem with dead things because if it's dead, it's dead. But God looks at it, no, I, I can bring that back to life. I can make these dry bones live. Come on, that's the God we serve today. So whatever condition we drug ourselves in here today, there's hope. And here's our four-point remedy. Number one, the first remedy when you're spiritually dead and want to be brought back to life is spiritual alertness. We, I was thinking of getting a bullhorn for this point and just start, you know, wake up. <laughs> Good morning. Wake up, right? Uh, you know when you're asleep and someone wakes you up with a loud noise? You know, in my house, an air horn, you got an air. In my house, you didn't sleep too late. Fred would come in, I remember a couple times, with pots and pans, and he'd bang them all together. Da, 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 have a little parade in the room. You're up, you know, I'm up, I'm up, I'm up, up. But sometimes we need the Holy Spirit to come with the air horn or the bull horn or the pots and pans, amen, and wake us up. And, and that's the first thing that needs to happen here is there needs to be a, a, a refreshing of spiritual alertness. You know, a big part of us maintaining our spiritual vitality is looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. The minute we say, ah, he's not coming back. Oh, it's going to be, it could be a thousand years, you know. Well, I'm just going to live my life and do my thing. That's what Noah's generation did. We have to look for his coming. It's the blessed hope that purifies us, amen, that Jesus is coming back. I want to be about the Father's business like Jesus was. I want to be found faithful, uh, you know, when the Lord comes. I, I don't want to be derelict in my duty. I don't want to be sitting on the sidelines. I don't want to be put out to pasture. They said to Spurgeon, they were forcing him to retire. He goes, do you want my Lord to find me idle when he comes? They were like, you're, you're too old. Go, you know, somewhere. Go to Florida where everybody goes. And he's like, I don't want to be idle. I got to be doing something for the kingdom of God. And that comes from being spiritually alert, from looking for the coming of Christ. Look, if he's coming, I want to look busy when he comes, amen? I want to be doing something significant when he comes. You know, it's all about keeping your head in the game spiritually. If you've ever been on a team with someone whose head wasn't in the game or you've been, you know, at a work crew or an office or whatever, I can remember as a young guy, you know, it's even worse now, but the, the work ethic in our nation has just, I mean, people, you know, they think manual labor is a Mexican evangelist. <laughs> Some of you are not even getting that. 
but there's no work ethic. I remember as a young guy being on a, 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 a crew and we're framing, we're nailing headers together, we're putting up walls, and there's somebody lollygagging over here. No, they're standing on the nail gun cord. They're just, they're <laughs> slowing you down. It's like I'm doing my work and your work, and you're not even helping. You, you just go, go in the porta potty and don't let me see you to lunch. But, you know, we've got to do our part. We've got to have our head in the game. And in the church where, you know, if, 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 you know, a few people are doing all the work and people are carrying their load and your load and not everybody's doing their part, it strains the body. So we've got to be alert. We've got to have our heads in the game. We've got to be doing our part. We've got to push aside the distractions and be useful in the, in the hands of the Lord and just do what he's called us to do. Amen. Number two, the second remedy here is this. Strengthen what remains. Look at that. It says, the things that were about to die. So Sardis is mostly dead, but there are some things that are in the dying process, and we're going to see that there's a few uh, glimmers of hope and life in Sardis as we go through the text here. But it's mostly dead. Jesus' pronunciation over them is dead. But he says, you know what? what? What you're doing that's right, strengthen those things that remain because they're about to die. Really what this is all about is getting before the Lord in brokenness and praying that God would revive our passion for the things that please him. We should be passionate about the things that please God. You know what? And our flesh hates that statement. As I'm saying it, the flesh is going, no, no, I'm passionate about the things that please me and the things that bring me comfort and the things that bring me pleasure. Come on. When you got the whole day left to yourself, what do you do? You do all the things you want to do. You're all looking at me like you, I'm speaking a different language here. Come on. And that's what the flesh does. It wants to please itself. But we need to get before God and say, Lord, I'm tired of pleasing myself. I'm tired of doing my own thing. I'm tired of having my way and it producing nothing in me. God, I want to have your way. I want to do your thing. I want to do your will today. Reignite that passion in me, passion for the things of the kingdom, passion for the body of Christ, passion for the move of God, passion for the lost. Come on this morning. If you don't clap, God will give me a church that's excited. I don't know where he'll send you or me, but just telling you. God, revive our passions for the things that please you. If you're serving God, if you're praying every day, if you're doing your devotions, you're in the Bible every morning, if you're giving to church, if you're attending church, if you're serving at church, keep the emphasis on doing those things and don't slip back one inch. Keep those things alive. Don't backslide. Don't quit. Oh, somebody else will serve with the kids. Somebody else will be on worship team. I'm tired. I did it for a long time. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. I've been here 30 years. If I can't leave, you can't leave. So let's get busy. Amen. <laughs> Amen. God, revive that passion in us. Keep the emphasis on the things that we're doing right and don't back down. Add to them. Increase them. Number three, remember the basics and do them diligently. It looks says what? So remember what you have received and heard and keep it. Do you ever notice, if you're, if you're getting older like I'm getting older, you notice that you and I forget things so easily? I know it's been said before, but I spend most of my day walking into rooms and trying to figure out why I'm there. <laughs> and usually I'm in a rush. I'm like, yeah. Oh, you know, it's like 30 steps out. I'm convinced that this is God's way of getting us to exercise, you know, because we wouldn't get, we run, we wouldn't move around. Uh, there's times I've been up and down the stairs of my house, Johnny, like five times in a row. That, 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 that. Is my wallet here? My glasses there? Is my phone here? Is it up and down? What is going on? Sometimes I just lay down on the carpet and go, I quit. But it's that memory it goes, and our spiritual memory goes too. We forget the things we've been taught. We forget the basics. We forget, you know, the things that when we did them, it added value and blessing to our lives. Come on, think back to the times when you were first saved and the simplicity of just worshiping with all your heart. Or every time you opened up the Bible, it seemed like the word of God sprung off the pages and exploded in your heart. Come on, that, that's what I'm talking about we got to remember and get back to that. 
Remember the basics. It's not complicated. It's just the basics, the, the basic tenets of the faith. And to do them, I love what it says here. So remember what you have received and heard. That's the simplicity of the gospel. And keep it. Just do what you know you should do. Amen? Remember the, the basics of the faith and, and do them now. Start now. Start today. If you're, pray, if you're not praying, start praying. If you're not reading, start reading. If you don't attend church, you just stumbled in here by accident today. Welcome back. You know, uh, make your church attendance. Serve. Give. Start doing it again. Do the basics and keep them. You know, this is not rocket science. Well, I wish I could figure this Christianity stuff out. It's not difficult. If we do the basics of the faith diligently with a humble heart, God will protect us and advance us in the kingdom of God. Amen? Booker T. Washington, the famous educator, recalled an entrance exam that he took getting into the prestigious Hampton Institute in, the Hampton Institute in Virginia. <coughs> So here's Booker T, an intelligent young man, goes uh, to get his entrance exam. As he goes there, the head teacher giving the exam simply asks Washington to take a broom and sweep the classroom. Now, if you got pride, that would be enough to offend the heck out of most of us and make us throw the broom down and go, I'm not going here. I'm an intellectual. I'm intelligent. I'm accomplished. I'm not sweeping anything. Booker had a different heart. He knew this was his chance. So he swept the room three times and dusted the furniture four times. When the teacher returned, she inspected the room closely. She ran a white glove over the hard wood and all the woodwork. She was unable to find even a single speck of dust. She turned to him and said, you will be a fine addition to this institution. Washington later said that that was the turning point in his life. Because he was willing to serve humbly and he was willing to do what he was told to do and do the basics, he was allowed to advance uh, into levels of uh, success and achievement that's, that most of us will never see. It starts with a humble heart to do the basics diligently. So pray every day and read the word every day and spend time at the feet of Jesus every day. You'd be surprised how far that will take you in the kingdom of God. The fourth remedy Jesus gives for the, the fact that they're spiritually dead <coughs> is he tells them what turns out to be the point of this sermon series. He calls Sardis to repent. And this is, you know, he saved the best for last because this is a key here. Be alert, you know, uh, remember, you, you, you got to do the basics diligently, but then he says to Sardis, repent. And we learned about repentance at the beginning of the series that repentance is not just a, you know, a contrite prayer that we make at the altar and then walk away. No, repentance requires change. It's a process. It requires a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of behavior. And that's why it takes time. If I come to the altar this morning and I bow down and I repent of things in my life that aren't right, when I get up here, all I've done is initiate the process. But repentance uh, takes time. It's a process. I have to walk out that door, and on Monday, I have to reorganize and re-strategize and reprioritize things in my life to make the change necessary to change the trajectory of where I'm going, amen? So understand, you know, he's calling them to repent, and it's going to take time. You know what? As I've been preaching this series, and I've been, uh, you know, in my own life finding areas where I need to repent, I am realizing more than ever, it takes a miracle of God to change, I can't change myself. You can't change yourself. We can do it for a little while, but if any real change is going to take place, we need the Lord's help. It's so hard to change the daily routine. We are so, we're such creatures of habit. Well, I do this, and then I do that, and then I read this, and then I watch TV, and then I play my guitar, and then I... And God says, no, 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 clear the decks, we're going to do this. And then we find ourselves reaching for all those things that were in our routine. It takes a miracle to change. But he calls them to repentance, and he calls us to repentance. And he offers us the hope of resurrecting dead things in all of our lives. What did Sardis need to repent of? Enjoying the status 
of being spiritual without actually being spiritual. These guys wore the robes and they had the titles and they, you know, they, they, they knew the office, but they weren't spiritual. They wanted to look good, but not actually be good. They wanted to play church, but not actually be the church. They were spiritual frauds, projecting one thing and not having it, clouds without rain. They had no resurrection power, no passion, no personal connection to Jesus, and no desire to address any of those things. That's a description of dead religion. We should be able to spot it and run from it as fast as we can. Jesus gives Sardis a dire warning. If you are not alert, it starts with that spiritual alertness. It starts with getting your head in the game. It starts uh, with us saying that I need to change and embracing repentance. He says, if you're not alert, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come. Jesus saying, I'm going to come to you, and you're not going to be ready for me, and it's going to be spiritually disastrous for you. Powerful things are said here in verse 5 and verse 4. Uh, he, he speaks of a remnant that's in the church there. And I want, you to, I want you to see this here, but you have a few people. Remember I said mostly dead, something's about to die, but listen to this. You have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. There were some people that survived the onslaught of spiritual death. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. I want to remind you of something today. When we stand before God, we will stand as individuals. God won't say, well, your parents weren't very good, or your boss wasn't very good, or your spouse wasn't very good. No, he's not going to say, oh, well, you're from New York, so you're, you know, um, you, you know uh, or you're from the United States, well, you guys are all done. And, you know, no, he's going to judge us individually. And these guys, you know, in the midst of a, a spiritual deadness, they had maintained their spiritual vitality. What a miracle of God. They were a remnant. Remember what we said, a remnant was a small surviving group. And God had kept for himself a remnant, even in a dead church. And they, they, they were those who, you know, survived the spiritual death and dormancy there. What made the, that small group in Sardis a remnant? They did not soil their garments. You got to get this today. You and I can make the choice not to bow to the knee, to compromise, to corruption, to the things of the world, to sin, and we can keep our garments clean. And when we do sin, we need to pray the, to the Lord to forgive us of our sin and we need to repent. Why? Because that keeps our garments clean. But you and I can be those who refuse to bow the knee to Baal, who refuse to worship the idols, who refuse to conform to the wickedness. It's a choice. And it's a choice we need to make. To the one who overcomes will be clothed the same way in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. Uh, this, is, this is a problematic scripture for the once saved, always saved crowd. Look what it says there. That's a startling thing. I will not erase his name from the book of life. Wow. And I will confess his name before my father. You know what Jesus said? If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. Our names have to be written in the Lamb's book of life. And, and, and you know, Jesus is speaking to the church here. You're dead and you need to repent and you need to be restored. Why? <clears throat> because your soul is teetering in the balance. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's hope for any dead thing. There's hope for churches that are dead, but it will take a miracle of God to bring genuine repentance. We need to pray for those who number themselves among the body of Christ, who departed from the preaching of the word, who don't preach the full counsel of the word, who avoid certain topics because they're cowards. We need to pray that the church would be the church. And we need to examine our own hearts and be like David and say, search me and know me. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lord, what's dead in me? What's dead in Rick? What's religious in me? Where have I lost my passion? God, show me and grant me the kindness of repentance that I might enjoy your restoration. As David said, restore a right spirit in me. Take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. 
We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let's give him praise this morning. Amen.